It was billed as the biggest series of the year for the Orioles. And the O's came up clutch, winning three out of four in Tampa Bay to take a little bit of control of the AL East. I'll recap an amazing Orioles weekend series coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Monday, July 24th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap an incredible Orioles series win over the weekend as they took three out of four from the Tampa Bay Rays in their biggest series in quite a few years. I'll start by getting you the five things you need to know from Sunday's great win. Then, the five things you need to know from Saturday's heroic ninth inning victory. And finally, shout out a couple more guys who made some big plays, had some key moments in this gigantic weekend for the Orioles. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast. Before we get there, though, just did want to thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms, and we're right here on YouTube. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. We're getting to the stretch run here. We're very, very close to the trade deadline. Things are heating up on Locked on Orioles, heating up for the O's. Thank you to the everydayers out there, and thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen of the day. For your first listen today, O's. Three out of four against the Tampa Bay Rays. That is what I'm talking about. We talked about the Thursday game, of course, on Friday's episode. So if you want to recap of that one, make sure to go back and listen to Friday. Also talked about the Shintaro Fujinami trade in that episode as well. But that was a key 10th inning Orioles 4-3 win. Well, they didn't do much offensively on Friday night, losing 3-0, tying the series at one game apiece, the four-game set. But they bounced back. A huge 6-5 win on Saturday, followed up with a 5-3 victory on Sunday. And the Orioles finished the weekend two games ahead of the Tampa Bay Rays sitting in first place in the AL East with the best record in the American League at 61 and 38. Now I'm going to start with getting you the five things you need to know from the game that just happened. Sunday afternoon, Orioles 5 and Rays 3 that clinched the series win for the Orioles. And the first thing you need to know is Ryan O'Hearn just can't be stopped. Now we'll talk about a little bit in a bit what he was able to do off the bench on Saturday. But every time we think, well, Ryan O'Hearn can't get this much better, he continues to do it because O'Hearn did really the one thing in Sunday's game that we hadn't seen him do yet this year. That is impact the baseball against a left-hander. Now, we've heard about you know the slight changes with the stance and things that the Orioles worked on with Ryan O'Hearn this year to get him from kind of the struggling bench bat with the Royals to the Orioles' cleanup hitter against right-handers right now. But the one thing the O's have done that I think has also helped him have success is they've kind of hid him from left-handers this year, right? And you can't blame him. He hasn't had success against lefties in his career. Your other first baseman in Ryan Mountcastle mashes lefties even when he's struggling elsewhere. So you get why O'Hearn wouldn't be playing against a lot of left-handers. But the situation came up on Sunday, 3-3 game in the sixth inning. And Ryan O'Hearn is leading off the sixth. Colin Poche comes out of the Rays bullpen, a left-hander. And with Ryan Mountcastle available on the bench, you know, Brandon Hyde could have easily gone to him and kept him in the game at first. Hyde was kind of thinking, well, O'Hearn will probably see another righty when he comes up later in the game and will want his bat up when that time comes. So he left him in there to lead off the game in a tie game. And what does he do? He hits his first home run against a lefty on the year. O'Hearn was just one for nine in 10 plate appearances against left-handers this season. He really hadn't gotten much of a chance, which honestly I get. They're basically trying to hide him from them completely. You can't blame the Orioles at all for that decision. But O'Hearn cranks one down the line. Now, it was only 94 off the bat, and it was only a 140 expected batting average but it was a home run at the drop over that short wall in left field, bangs it right off the foul pole, 331 feet for a solo shot that ended up being the game-winning hit for the Orioles. Just, I mean, really, what can't this guy do? It was part of a two-for-four day in which he also had a double in the game, 313 average, 886 OPS. 
O'Hearn, bit by bit, you know, has been, you could say, if you throw sample size out the window, the Orioles' best hitter so far this season. What a job by the front office to go get Ryan O'Hearn. Second thing you need to know from this one, going back to earlier in the game, I believe that Gunnar Henderson home run may not have landed yet. That thing was an absolute rocket. A two-run shot for Henderson in the second inning that put the Orioles up 3-0. He hit it off of Ray's rookie starter, Taj Bradley, who allowed three runs over five innings of work in Sunday's game. It hit what they were calling the D-ring in the trop, which is you know one of those rings that comes off the catwalks in just the weird way the Tropicana Field was built. And according to the Orioles broadcast, that was just the 39th home run hit off that, quote, D ring out there since the trop opened. There's been a lot of home runs hit there. 39 is not a lot of them. That ball went where not many have gone before, off the bat of Gunnar Henderson, who just got a hanging slider and pummeled this baseball 111.2 miles per hour off the bat. The estimated distance was 446 feet, which only makes it Gunnar's second longest homer of the year. His Utah Street Blast against the Royals earlier this year was number one at 461. That thing looked like it was going 500 feet off the bat. Just incredible contact from Gunnar Henderson. He continues to be just amazing. Had a great weekend. He's hitting better and better. It's fun to watch this kid play. And I mean, he is right back in that AL Rookie of the Year race. That thing was smashed off the bat of Gunnar Henderson, who, I mean, he also singled in the first inning and scored on an Adley Rutschman RBI double to get the Orioles on the board and up one nothing. He just continues to do great things for this ball club. Third thing you need to know from Sunday's 5-3 to three win as we switch it over to the pitching side, something did not look quite right with Tyler Wells. And it showed in the fact that for the second straight start, Wells was not able to complete five innings. After completing five innings in every single start so far this season, he gave up five runs over two innings against the Dodgers on Tuesday, was pulled. And then this one was a little more interesting. The final line for Tyler Wells in Sunday's game, I mean, looked better, right? Looked better than Tuesday. He pitched more than double the innings. He gave up less runs. It was four and a third, three runs, only one hit. Five Ks, four walks, a homer, 77 pitches, and just two hard hit balls is solid. But something in the mechanics looked off for Tyler Wells. I hope it's not injury, and I hope it was just a little bit of fatigue. His velocities were pretty much the same they've been all year, so that's not something you have to worry about. But his command was essentially gone. I mean, Wells did not allow a hit through four innings in this game. He had allowed one run in four hittings with zero hits. I don't know how he was doing it. The first hit was a two-run shot by Yandy Diaz in the fifth after a leadoff walk that tied the game at three, and he got Juan DeFranco to pop out, and he was rightfully pulled from the game, even though he's only at 77 pitches. He just didn't look right. Tyler Wells, who, if he walks more than two batters in an outing, you start to get very worried. He issued six total free passes in this game, four walks and two hit batters. And it's not like he pitched into the eighth inning. He threw only four and a third. So while it's nice that he only gave up one hit, it was unfortunate that that one hit was the two-run homer by Diaz. And it's nice that he still got 10 whiffs and you know, they were swinging and missing at his slider a good amount. He basically had no command. And for a guy in Tyler Wells, who for a long time this year had the lowest whip of any qualified starter in baseball, was by far the Orioles' best starter when it came to command. You know, a normal start for him is one walk in six innings. To allow four walks and two hit batters after he didn't really walk a lot of guys Tuesday but got hit around hard, that is kind of a concerning two-start stretch. And I said this on Twitter on Sunday, and I'll echo it now. Although Tuesday's start against the Dodgers was worse for the team, like Wells did a much better job of giving the Orioles a chance to win, which of course they did do on Sunday. Sunday start concerned me a lot more because Tuesday was just, he gave up some hits, usually doesn't give up those hits, gave up some homers. Sunday was like, walk, 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 hit batter, hit batter, walk. That's not Tyler Wells. And that is something to watch here. They gave him a little extra time over the All-Star break because you know he's already basically passed the amount of innings he's thrown in his professional career in one season, just with the Tommy John and the injuries and the shortened season and being a reliever in 2021. We'll see what happens here. I mean, he may need his another start skipped here just to kind of get him back in balance. I mean, you could throw him in the bullpen for two weeks and, and start Cole Irvin for a couple of weeks just to switch things up. But I am a little bit concerned about Tyler Wells right now. 
Fourth thing you need to know from the 5-3 to three win Sunday is that the before Felix Bautista, part of the bullpen, really made you feel a little bit better in Sunday's win. And it all started with Mike Bauman, who, if you had to rank the top five most impactful players of this weekend, I would put Mike Bauman in there, even though he only pitched in one game. But that one outing was huge for the Orioles on Sunday. After Wells had just shown that he couldn't throw a strike, Bauman came in with one out in the fifth inning in a 3-3 game and just rolled through this Rays lineup. Two and two-thirds scoreless and hitless innings for Bauman with two strikeouts and two walks through 38 pitches, came in with one out in the fifth, got the O's through the seventh, tied for his longest outing of the season. Last time, the only other time he went two and two-thirds was in April against Boston. But it was just so fun to watch Mike Bauman do that. And it wasn't like he was like number one most dominant outing of the year for Bauman. But he mixed his stuff well. Good mix between the fastball, curveball, and slider. He had the hitters off balance. Yeah, he issued a couple of walks. But right after those walks, he went after guys immediately and didn't let it snowball into a big inning. Great job by Bauman. I was starting to question him a little bit because the walks have been a real issue lately. But he worked around them on Sunday and gave what the Orioles' bullpen desperately needed, was a two-plus inning scoreless outing to get them back on track. And then Yenye Cano looked a little bit better. He threw a one 2 3 inning with a strikeout in the eighth to keep the 5-3 to lead. He had looked okay when he pitched on Saturday. This was his fourth outing in five games. You could tell the fatigue. His arm slot had been dropping, which led to less kind of run on the sinker and the changeup. He was throwing a lot more sliders because actually the sliders got more movement when he throws it for more of a sidearm slot that he has been doing, I would still rather him be for more up top because that's when he was super dominant early in the year. And a lot of times fatigue or maybe an injury can cause that arm slot to drop a little bit. But the Orioles apparently were happier with what they saw Saturday. And I think they're going to be happier with what they saw Sunday with the one, two, three inning. And then the fifth and final thing you need to know is, yeah, Felix Bautista, he is still going to be the rock of this bullpen. Fourth outing in five days for Bautista as he comes on in the ninth with a 5-3 lead. And yes, he did give up a couple of singles in the inning to Manuel Margot and Yandy Diaz, but it did not matter. He once again strikes out the side, gets Wander Franco with a nasty splitter to end the game. His ERA is down to .92 as he finished off the save. He was just amazing in this series for the Orioles, and he clinched the win, and he clinched the series win with a 5-3 victory on Sunday. But the Orioles wouldn't have even been in position to win this series on Sunday had they not had some heroics in the ninth inning after blowing a lead in Saturday's game. And when we come back, I'll recap Saturday's win. The five things you need to know is the O's took an early lead. Grayson looked good. Then it all came crumbling down until the veterans stepped up in the ninth. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Sleeper. Sleeper is the place I'm going right now to play daily fantasy sports because on Sleeper, they just make it super easy. Do you want to win 100 times your money on daily fantasy baseball? Sleeper is now offering up to a 100 time payout for up to eight pick contests. Choose as many as eight players that you like and pick more or less on your favorite baseball stats like homers, K's, hits, and more. Get your picks right and you could win big. You just go on the app. It's super easy to do. You pick your favorite players to get more or less. And hey, the entries can be made in 30 seconds or less. It's super easy. You get safe and fast withdrawals of your money as well. So use promo code locked on and you'll get up to a $100 match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. Currently operational in over 30 states. Check out Sleeper today. So the Orioles got a gigantic series win over the weekend, taking three out of four from the Tampa Bay Rays, winning it five to three on Sunday to clinch the series. But on Saturday, they did a nice job of clinching at least a four game split, getting a six to five win in that one. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from Saturday's victory. And the first thing you need to know is let's fast forward to the ninth inning. The Orioles veterans, the guys they brought in this offseason, Got the job done in the ninth inning for a team that has called up so much young talent and relied on so much young talent with Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutschman and now getting Jordan Westberg here, and getting Colton Kowser here. And even in a game where Grayson Rodriguez pitched very well, and we'll get to it, it was the veterans. 
Top of the ninth inning after the O's had blown the lead. It's a 5-5 game. Pete Fairbanks comes in. Now, he was pitching for the third time in three days, and his stuff wasn't as sharp. But Adam Frazier comes to the plate. And what does he do? Just reaches out on a 1-2 changeup and just pokes it into left field for a base hit. Then, here comes James McCann. Thought the O's might pinch hit for him. Instead, they kept him in because the plan was to bunt. And Brandon Hyde said after the game, listen, I'm trying, I'm bunting because I'm trying to get Felix Bautista a one run lead. I'm playing for one run because Felix is so good, he can protect a one run lead. And it kind of makes sense, honestly, when Hyde talks about it like that. You know, I'm not a fan of the sacrifice bunt, but I get why he's doing it. And it's not like James McCann's a great hitter. McCann bunts a fastball that almost hit him square in the neck. The ball was coming right towards him, and somehow the ball hits on the handle of the bat between his two hands as he's going out to bunt it. It was an absurd bunt from James McCann, a 99-mile-per-hour fastball coming towards his head, and he somehow gets it down to advance Frazier to second, and then up comes Ryan O'Hearn, and he battles and battles, and he gets a hanging breaking ball from Fairbanks, and he loops it into right field for a base hit. Frazier scores, and the Orioles take the lead. This team, all together, I mean, Brandon Hyde has done a great job just using all of his hitters. He did it on Saturday. He used all 13 hitters in that game. He gets guys in and out of the lineup, you know, not, not having guys sit for too, too long. And has done a great job of spreading out the playing time because all these guys in this group can contribute in one way or another. And he showed that, hey, the vets can do it too in the ninth inning on Saturday. Second thing you need to know from Saturday's 6-5 to five win is that Grayson Rodriguez took another step forward for the Orioles in this one. In his second start back since returning from AAA, Rodriguez, it was, you could argue, his best start in the big leagues so far. Grayson lasting five and two-thirds innings, allowing two runs on three hits with six Ks and two walks, no homers, and just four hard-hit balls allowed on 93 pitches. He was oh-so-close to getting through six scoreless innings. He allowed first and second, or second and third, I should say, with nobody out in the sixth inning. Got the next two hitters out. Did a great job of getting Rene Pinto to strike out. Yandy Diaz grounds out and the runner doesn't come home. He gets one and two on Wander Franco, throws a good changeup, but Franco makes it even better swing and just rolls it to where the shortstop would be had the shift not been on for a two-run single to kind of get the raise on the board, make it a 5-2 game at that point. And Grayson came out. He made a good enough pitch to get a strikeout or a lazy ground out to end the inning. Just a great hitter in Wander Franco. Beat him right there. But I was so impressed with Grayson Rodriguez in this game. He attacked more, threw more strikes. The command was even better. I mean, these are a lot of things we said about his start Monday night that we thought looked good. But they looked even better on Saturday afternoon. 17 whiffs was his career high. He had at least two on all of his pitches. He was really heavy on the changeup once again. He trusted the slider. He threw some ridiculous sliders, got three whiffs on five swings on that pitch. Even two whiffs on three curveball swings was really good. It wasn't his best changeup, but it was really good for stretches in this game. The fastball, good velocity. All the velo was up once again. Like the slider velo was up. The fastball velo was up. It was great stuff from Grayson Rodriguez. He just looks more confident out there. And specifically way more confident in his off-speed pitches, which is something we didn't see in his first stint in the big leagues. We are seeing it now. That is huge. And at this point, like, he's got himself a spot in the rotation again. Now, if it goes south again, the O's are in a pennant race. They're going to have to make some decisions. But right now, I trust him going out there every five days. And is the next step to get through six innings? Yeah, it is. He hasn't done that yet at the big league level. A couple of starts with five and two-thirds. But I think he can do it. He was one pitch away on Saturday. The stuff is looking better. This is the Grayson Rodriguez we were promised. Whatever he worked on in AAA, it is working for Grayson. Third thing you need to know from this one as we move it over to the Orioles offense earlier in the game. The O's got the one run in the ninth to uh, take home the 6-5 to five win, but the other five runs came in the fourth inning. That is when the Orioles just absolutely ambushed the Ray starter Shane McClanahan. McClanahan, who came in like a 2-6 ERA, one of the Cy Young contenders in the American League, Three pretty spotless innings to start the game, but the O's got to him in that fourth inning. They put up a five spot on McClanahan, ended up knocking him out of the game after the fourth, after that inning, and they just attacked him, right? Mount Castle, after a Santander pop-out, starts the inning. Mount Castle with a rocket single. Then Aaron Hicks strikes out, and you're basically looking at a two-out rally here. 
You've got Mount Castle on first with two down. Gunnar Henderson gets a bloop single, goes into second on the throw. Ramon Arias walks to load the bases. And it was really interesting there in that fourth inning because McClanahan had Arias three and two with two outs and runners on second and third. So a base was open at first. And he had James McCann waiting on deck, who hasn't exactly gotten a lot of hits this year. And McClanahan threw a slider, even though his changeup's been amazing. He threw a slider in the dirt. Arias didn't chase, worked a walk. And Kevin Brown and Ben McDonald were talking about it on the broadcast saying, like, why would he throw that slider there? I thought it was a good idea because I, in my mind, was like, you know what? Arias has been swinging the bat well lately. If I walk him, I walk him no damage. And I get to get James McCann out, right? Like, he gets himself out. Well, James McCann was not one to um, agree to that McClanahan plan. First pitch, little slider, 87, middle of the plate. McCann crushes one on a line, 105 off the bat into left center field for a two-run double to give the O's a 2-0 lead, but they weren't done. Here comes Jorge Mateo, who can still hit lefties. What does he do? Crank one off the wall in left field for a two-run double to make it 4 nothing, And then for good measure, a little bloop double into right off the bat of Austin Hayes makes it 5 nothing. Again, all of this done with two outs and a runner on first. Two-out rally for five runs against Shane McClanahan, and that was huge, huge for the Orioles in this game. McClanahan, who has dominated the O's. Well, he's dominated a lot of teams. He's had a great career, but specifically has dominated his hometown team. Grew up in Baltimore, big Orioles fan, had a big Cal Ripken Jr. poster on his wall, and the O's got to him in that fourth inning. Fourth thing you need to know from Saturday's 6-5 to five win is that we saw kind of both sides of Shintaro Fujinami in his second Orioles outing. His first one came on Friday night. He allowed a first pitch homer to Jose Siri, who kind of ambushed a 99 mile per hour fastball. But then he looked good after that. Two ground outs and a strikeout of Wander Franco to end the inning. And listen, Brandon Hyde doesn't have a lot of relievers that he's super trusting right now. So with a five to three lead in the bottom of the eighth, after Cano had pitched in the seventh, Hyde goes to Fujinami in the eighth inning. I didn't mind it. Hyde said after the game, Fuji told him that he was feeling good, ready to go on back to back days. He did it with the A's and he just didn't have it. 10 of his first 12 pitches were balls. He walks the first two batters, throws a wild pitch. Then Wander Franco helps him out with a ground out, makes it 5-4, gets a big strikeout with a nasty splitter to Harold Ramirez. And he was 1-2 on a Rosarena, almost had him. And then Rosarena hits a one-hopper to short that Mateo couldn't handle. Would have been a tough play at first anyway. The tying run scores, and that was it for Fujinami. We saw the good and the bad really in both of those first two outings. The Orioles did activate him to the roster Friday, optioned Logan Gillespie back down to AAA. And we saw the good and the bad. That's kind of what you're going to see from Fujinami. Like, they're not going to trust him to be an eighth and ninth inning guy all the time. You saw a high-velocity fastball. It averaged 100 in that outing. He was up to 102. You saw a couple of nasty splitters. You saw him blow the fastball by guys, and you also saw him struggle to throw strikes early in the inning. That's what you're going to see from time to time from Fujinami. It's better than what the O's have had in some instances. It'll be frustrating in others. But it's the roller coaster ride we'll be on. Hopefully, the O's will go get another pitcher before the deadline passes. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from Saturday's blown lead and then scoring again win is well, can you really trust anyone else but Felix Bautista right now? And maybe you're feeling a little bit better about Bauman and maybe a little bit better about Cano after the good outings for each of them on Sunday. But think about how you were feeling when that game ended on Saturday. I mean, Felix was awesome. In the bottom of the ninth inning, as he always is, right? Gets five whiffs. One, two, three, ninth. Boom. Orioles have won two out of three in the series. But you think about that game and how the bullpen went. After Grayson Rodriguez leaves the game, James McCann throws a runner out to end the sixth inning. So Danny Coulomb, who had come in, didn't really have to do much. Then Coulomb allows a couple of hits, only records one walk or one out, I should say, in the seventh. Then Yenye Cano comes on. He gives up a hit. Didn't have his best stuff. Got out of the seventh. The lead's still intact. Then they go to Fujinami. He struggles with the walks. And CNL Perez did get a huge strikeout to finish the eighth and keep it tied. But who are you really feeling good about out there? And you had Brian Baker had a, a shaky outing you know, before that. And Mike Bauman before Sunday it looked a little shaky. And your other reliever is like Cole Irvin at this point. I mean, how are you feeling there? Even after it looks a little better, like, you can't feel great still right now about the O's bullpen. They're winning games, but they got to add to it. I think that's what Saturday's game showed you is like they can win games because they're super talented. But even with Fujinami, and even if he's better than he was Saturday, they're going to need at least one more reliever 
in this bullpen. And you hope he maybe it can be Austin Voth. You know, he pitched Saturday in double A on rehab. Maybe it can be DL Hall one day. Maybe when Nick Vespi comes back, it can be him. You know, maybe you can move somebody else to the bullpen. I mean, maybe Michael Givens could come back. There's a lot of maybes there, but I think your best safest bet is go and get somebody on the trade market to add to Fujinami as well. But the O's did get those two wins on Saturday and Sunday to take three out of four in the series. But coming up next, wanted to just give a couple more shout outs to some guys who maybe didn't get mentioned in those two wins, but had some big moments this weekend for the O's and more positives, more up arrows for the Orioles heading into Philly this week. So the Orioles took three out of four from the Rays this weekend in their biggest series of the year. They now have a two-game lead over the Rays in the American League East. This Rays team that was 29-7, and they were 13-0 and to start the year. They had a double-digit lead over teams at one point. They had a six-game lead over the O's heading into July itself, and the O's now have a two-game advantage in the division. Next up for the O's, Little interleague ball this week. A three-game series in the city of brotherly love against the defending National League champions as the O's hit the road to take on the Phillies. And it all starts tonight with a 6.40 p.m. Eastern time start. Phillies and O's. Dean Kramer will take the hill for the Orioles. It's been a little bit of a roller coaster season for Kramer with his 4.80 ERA. He had those back-to-back great starts on either side of the break. Then he was not good against the Dodgers the other day. Four and two-thirds innings, five runs allowed on four hits, one K and four walks. He needs to be better than that tonight against a good Phillies lineup. This Phillies team comes in at 53 and 46 on the season, currently fighting for a wild card spot in the National League, sitting just a half game back at the moment of the final spot. They will go with the guy who's pretty much been their number five starter for at least the recent part of this season, and that is the lefty Christopher Sanchez, who in 35 and a third innings this year does have a 3.06 ERA, but he's kind of a five and dive guy, but he's done pretty good at that. His last start against the Brewers, five innings, one run, six hits, three strikeouts, and one walk for the left-hander. And you can listen to every single pitch of the Orioles' hometown radio broadcast of tonight's game one between the O's and the Phils on the SXM app through SiriusXM. Just download the app and search Orioles. But I hope you watch the games or listen to them with the SFXFM app this weekend and caught some of the action O's and Rays. And hey, there were a couple performances that I didn't get a chance to shout out with the two wins on Saturday and Sunday that really helped out the O's and, and just a color, couple of other notes and shout outs from the weekend to finish off the pod. We'll start with Kyle Bradish, who was kind of the one positive note from Friday. I didn't really talk about Friday's game because It ended in two hours and nine minutes, and the Orioles lost 3-0. But Kyle Bradish was good. Six innings, two runs, six hits, five Ks, and a walk. Allowed the one solo homer. Did get hit a little harder than usual. Ten hard hit balls in six innings. But I still liked what I saw from Kyle Bradish. Just continues this great stretch of pitching. Twelve whiffs for him on the night. He was heavy with the breaking ball. Slider and curveball were his top two pitches. Just ho-hum for Kyle Bradish. I mean, listen, the offense did... Pretty much absolutely nothing. No runs on two hits on Friday night. It was a Ryan Mountcastle double and a Ryan O'Hearn single. That was all the offense had. Two walks from Adley as well. Those were their base runners. Zach Eflin just diced him for seven scoreless with eight strikeouts. Sometimes that happens. The Rays pitch well. That's kind of what happened on Friday night. But shout out to Ryan Mountcastle too, who had that double in Friday night's game, starting as the DH hitting fifth. Also got the start on Saturday, had a single in that game. And, you know, we didn't see him Sunday, but hey, you know, he got a hit at each of the two games he played in. And, you know, maybe he's settling into a little bit more of this kind of short side of the platoon role that he's playing with Ryan O'Hearn. Also had a shout out Gunnar Henderson's defense because it's just been spectacular. Whether he's playing third base or shortstop, it's been amazing to see. The play he made Friday night, that was the other kind of key point of the loss on Friday. That sliding play he made up the middle playing shortstop where he dove, did a spin move on his knees, and then threw a rocket from his knees to get the out. was just outstanding. Made a couple of nice barehanded plays at third base. I mean, the double play he turned on Saturday with Grayson on the mound in the fifth inning where he made a diving stop to catch a line drive down the line, got up and threw a laser over to first base to double off the runner to end the inning. Grayson was fired up after that play. I mean... It's just fun to watch Gunnar Henderson right now, right? I mean, at the plate, he he continues to be scorching hot. It's up to an 818 OPS, hit that crazy homer on Sunday, but the defense is getting better and better and better. And even, you know, going back to Thursday night in the win, 
You know, the the turn to the double play, that rocket he threw to first to just get Brandon Lau to end the game in the 10th inning. So many tools defensively. Shout out to CNL Perez as well. I already mentioned him once, but kind of, you know, when many people weren't mostly watching anymore in a 3 nothing game in the 8th inning Friday, he came back out there after a rough outing when he returned off the injured list on Tuesday night. And he threw a 1-2-3 inning with two strikeouts in the 8th on Friday. And that was a really good sign from CNL Perez, who had had five consecutive scoreless innings before he went on the I.L. with the elbow soreness. Just had kind of a weird, unfortunate outing when he came back on Tuesday. But then he got the 1-2-3 on Friday. And then on Saturday, after the rest of the bullpen had kind of imploded, he came out there with the go-ahead run on second and two down in the eighth and had a great battle with Brandon Lau, but struck him out looking with a fastball to get a huge out in that eighth inning. If Perez, you know, I've given up on the fact on CNL Perez being the 1.40 ERA version of himself that we saw in 2022, but if he can be closer to what we saw right before the All-Star break and right before the IL stint and really right before or at least these last two outings, that is a helpful bullpen piece that the Orioles will need. Also, shout out to the couple of the O's rookies who didn't make a huge impact this weekend. Yes, Colton Kowser had the big go-ahead sack fly that was the winning RBI Thursday. Didn't do a whole lot after that, but his swing is starting to look a lot better. Now, he did reach on once on an error, once on a drop third strike on Sunday, but he also hit a couple of balls really, really hard and was not rewarded with an 0 for 4 on Sunday and is now hitting 111 on the season. But again, it's early. Remember, Adley struggled, Gunner struggled. Guys struggle when they first get to the big leagues. He's not the prospect that Gunnar and Adley were. He wasn't the number one prospect in all of baseball. But he hit one 106 off the bat for a line out in the second. Hit one 98 off the bat for a line out in the fourth. Both of those batted balls had an expected batting average of almost 700. So he's starting to swing it a little bit better. And I think the hits will start to come soon for Kowser. And also Jordan Westberg, who you know had a tough night Friday night. Right, He goes 0 for 3 with three strikeouts. And he comes back out there, you know, Saturday and Sunday, neither game, he he wasn't even in the starting lineup. But Saturday comes out as a pinch runner, steals a base late in the game, plays third base in the bottom of the ninth inning. Just knowing his role, getting his first career steal and helping out the team was huge for the Orioles in this one. And then finally, just wanted to shout out what the O's were able to do this weekend because, of course, it's huge to win the series. And, of course, it's huge to take a two-game lead in the AL East. But if you look at the season series now, the Orioles are now 6-3 and three against the Rays this season. Remember, you only play your divisional opponents 13 games with the new, more balanced schedule now. For the Orioles, meaning they only have one series left against the Rays. It's a four-game series at Camden Yards in mid-September. The only way the Orioles would lose the season series to the Rays is if they got swept in that series. That would mean the Rays would win at 7-6. to six. But if the O's can at least win one of those four games, which I trust they would, they would at least win the season series by a game. And the reason that is such a big deal is this could be an AL East race that comes down to the wire between the Orioles and the Rays. And as you may know, game 163 no longer exists. There are no more tiebreaker games in Major League Baseball. That was as of the last CBA. Instead of that, if there is a tie, the tiebreaker goes to head-to-head record. So as long as the O's can win one out of four when Tampa comes to town in September – they would have that head-to-head record. And if they ended the season with the same record, the Orioles would win the division. That is why this series was even bigger when you look forward for the O's here in 2023. But it's your first place, Orioles. They take three out of four. What a weekend it was. Next up, it is the Phillies. Going to Philadelphia. And some weird stuff happened uh, the last time they went there back in 2020. We will see what they can do here tonight. And I'll be back on the pod tomorrow. We will recap game one between the Orioles and the Phillies. And we'll take a closer look at the bullpen here because I'm going to break out the bullpen trust rankings once again. Start thinking about it now. Like, who do you trust besides Felix in the O's pen right now? We'll talk about that coming up on tomorrow's episode. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, your first place team, every day.